Good morning, everybody. Good morning to those of you online who are joining us today. Um, we want to say welcome, and uh, if you haven't been here recently, we'd love to invite you back. Come on back as soon as you possibly can. For those of you who are already here, enjoy yourself. We've got about another 10 minutes before we get started here. Grab a bite to eat. Oh, look at that. There's no food. Nobody signed up for snacks. We need people to sign up for snacks, guys. The sign-up sheet is right back here. As you're going out, you'll see it up on the bulletin board there. All it means is you bring maybe some fruit next week or some donuts or whatever it may be. Um, so we'd really appreciate if you could help out with that, that aspect. Also want to um, just encourage you guys, if you have any prayer requests at all, our white prayer box is back here. Write down your requests, write down your praise, whatever it may be. Drop it in the box, and we'll take some time, and we'll pray for that during the course of the service. But in the meantime, right now, just enjoy each other, have some fellowship together, have a great time getting to know each other. Talk to somebody you don't know. If you see someone sitting by themselves, join them, talk to them, and uh, we'll get started here in about uh, eight minutes or so. All right? Thanks. people do we have out there tonight? <laughs> Sing this with me. We lift you up. 
Okay, two minutes, two minutes with Susan and the band. We're going to get started.
Okay, everybody out in the gym, time to come on in. Time to start, guys. Thank you. Oh, I just love, behold, he comes, and someday we will see him coming. We have a small group. We have the Abbott family. Yay! Woo! And we have Josh. Yay! So we got the whole clan here. So uh, we do have instruments that come, but sometimes you, we have schedules that we kind of just have the Satan that kind of niggled, oh, just a few more minutes to sleep, right? So Satan kind of got sort of a little bit of battle win this time, but he's not victorious. Don't ever think that. God will provide music and provide voices, and we do have uh, some voices here. Thank you. We have no colds right now. Our first song is going to be This is the Day. So I, we got to change Josh. Sorry, Josh. So <laughs> we're going to do the song <laughs> twice. And if you feel like clapping, feel like stomping your feet, Go for it, baby. Let it. I mean, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Even if it's raining, even if it's snowing, the sunshine in our hearts, God has lifted us from the dead, and thank you for that. And then our second song, we do have, we want to branch out to more contemporary stuff, but we're trying to, you know, make sure you guys know the song. And please help us sing. I, you don't want me to sing up there. That's why I got some real voices up here. Our last one is going to be, Father, I adore you, and it's an older song, but it's around in three parts, and I've got three people that are going to be singing different parts. So please stand with us, and we'll open up a prayer, and then we're just going to go nonstop into the song. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the people that are here. I pray for John and Heather as they're enjoying their special time with their family and uh, grandchildren and son and, and uh, daughter-in-law. Father, I thank you for uh, Pastor Dave with his message that he's bringing. I thank you for the Youth Nation group that, you know, people are trying, you know, to make a difference and, and make a difference in people's lives. And that's what you brought us here on this earth is to worship and adore you and to make a difference. Sometimes we live one life in one area and we're not, uh, we don't practice what we preach. So forgive us, Father, for that. So, but in all honesty, Father, I am thankful that you have made me with the, the uh, handicap that I have because it makes me want to strive better and all of us have handicaps and uh, it's what you have put through. I think of Paul with the, uh, the thorn in his flesh when he prayed three times, Father, please take this away from me. And you said, no, my grace is sufficient. So that is my prayer today that your grace is sufficient for all of us. So guide us now for the rest of this time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go.
We're going to sing this song all the way through, um, Father, I Adore You. Now, it's, it's just that, and then it goes to Jesus, I Adore You, then Spirit, I Adore You. Now, what we're going to do, Ron is going to start it. And do you remember back in your childhood days, row, row, row your boat when you did it as a round, you know? Well, that's what I'd like to try to do, but we're going to do it one time with these guys doing it. Then we're going to do it again, and we're going to split it up so that we'll have, like, Ron will have his group, and then uh, Jen will have her group, and then Annie will have her group, okay? We'll see how well it will really come out. So first time we're going to kind of go through it, just in case you've never heard of it. It's really simple, really slow, and it's worshipful. Okay. how easy that is so let's let's try to figure out how we're going to do it okay so from um linda and carrie over you're going to follow ron okay you poor people <laughs> oh and with jen we're going to have uh donnie vaughn and i know i don't know if you go, so jen you may have to get your microphone up there uh, uh let, let you, would you like your brother-in-law and uh, sister-in-law to yeah. kind of take pits? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to have you guys go and Jocelyn. Oh, you want to be with Annie? Well, Annie <laughs> can do it. I, so, so I'm going to put Austin and these guys over here. I know that these are the singers over here, too. So they will go with Annie. So please take pity on Jen, okay? <laughs> She's in the middle. All right, let's Thanks. take it from the beginning. Do it again. Okay, here we go. So you guys are going to stop with Ron. be seated. Good job. That was fun. We sounded better than I thought we would. I, I didn't have a lot of hope at the very outset. Aww, no, I always, I, I, oh, no, I always feel good about it. I just didn't know how we'd all do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Susan and the Abbott family. Um, at this time, what we like to do, as, you, as many of you already know, is we just want to take some time for prayer, for some praises. Are there any praises for anything that God's done in your life this week? Any? Josh is almost through boot camp. Josh is almost through boot camp. Praise God. 
And here we have a picture of Josh. We need to keep praying for him, though. Just that he has strength, stamina, and that he does a good job. Um, and we will, we will continue to do that. Uh, any other praises? You're in your house. Good. Where, where are you living? You're living in Trenton, so we're all coming over after the service today. Well, just show up at your door, and we expect a nice big meal, so be ready for that. Um, okay, Dean. Is that a praise or a prayer request? You do have one. Okay, did, he, did everyone hear that? Jody's been having some electrical problems with her car, and they've been looking to get a new car, and they did get something, a reliable car for, the, for and through the winter, so praise God for that. That's great. That's great. Any other praises, guys? Go ahead, Sam. Yeah. God certainly does answer prayer. And, uh, and sometimes it's kind of vague, but at the same time, it's just, it's just great because we know we have a God who's faithful and who cares about us. How many of you can say, God is faithful and he cares about me? You can show me your hands. Isn't it true? What a wonderful God we serve. Praise God for that. Praise God. Any prayer requests today that have not been put over in the um, uh, white box over there? Jody. Nadine Lewis, car accident. She's okay. Her car is okay, actually, but she's got some whiplash, for those of you who didn't hear. So let's just pray for quick healing in her life and uh, comfort. Any other prayer requests? Okay, Annie? Okay, what's happening with your sister? Eighth anniversary. I think I have that here on one of these sheets. Do I? Okay. Um, eighth anniversary. So let's take a couple minutes to pray, guys. Oh, Sam, go ahead. One more. Pray for that lady that lost her brother and husband and son all on the same day. Yeah. Um, did you know her name? Did some, Lori Tilton? Tilton? Yeah, Lisa Pinkham. The whole Pinkham family. Uh, Matt comes here, his, his visits with us sometime, sometimes, so just write the Pinkham family. Yeah, that's tragic, and we don't know why God allows that kind of stuff to happen. And we, it just blows you away when you think about it. And um, we don't, I, I don't know the, all the details of it, but, I mean, people who dabble, I, I'm not saying there was drugs involved, I'm say, not saying there wasn't, or there was, but that's what happens. What's that? I'm sorry? Yeah, it, it, does, it doesn't matter, right. Every, everybody... Is created by God and loves and God loves people, and that's very unfortunate. But let's take let's take a couple of minutes and we'll pray specifically. I got a whole list of things here. Lord, we come before you. Thank you that we can come to you. Thank you that you listen. Thank you that you're a faithful, caring, gracious God. Help us never lose sight of that. Even when we mess up, even when we sin, even when we fail, and throughout the, the things that we come with, the baggage we come with, Lord, you forgive our sins. You shed your blood for us, and so we come praising you and grateful for that. Lord, we just want to lift up Nadine to you. Pray that you would bring quick healing to her. Pray, thank you that she is safe and uh, that the, her car is okay and that there's no major costs, at least that we know about so far. And I pray that you would just bring quick healing to her body and relief of pain to her. Lord, we pray specifically for uh, Lori Tilton, and, uh, who's lost, lost three family members, Lord all on the same day, all tragically, all suddenly. And the, the, the horror of this thing that has struck the community, Lord, we, we pray specifically for your comfort in her life and that there would be people who would come around her to support her, to love her, to be there for her, encourage her. If she doesn't know you, God, I pray she'd come to you and, and she'd find her hope and her peace and her comfort in Jesus. And that would, you would somehow bring some sense out of this senseless act, this senseless tragedy. Lord, we pray specifically for the Pinkham family who have lost loved ones also, that you would do the exact same thing in their lives. We pray for Josh. We thank you that he's doing well at boot camp, that he's got, gotten through his final stage. And we pray specifically that you would help Josh to, um, 
uh, just continue to stay strong, that you would give him stamina, that you would help him to finish well. Lord, we pray and thank you that Jody has gotten a car that is reliable, that she'll get through the winter, and um, uh, just thank you for your faithfulness, because that was looking like a really hard situation there, which we didn't know what was going to happen. And today, Lord, today's the eighth anniversary of um, Aaron's um, brother and father um, losing their lives in a car accident. I just pray you'd give her peace, and that you would continue to heal the pain uh, it feels like when we lose someone that there's an open wound, and over time that wound only closes so much. There's still grief, even years later. So just be with her today, God. We pray specifically for our friends, our family, our coworkers, those on the Sea of Salvation over here. The names that are written there, God, are, are people, people who are made to know you, and I pray you'd save each and every one and reveal yourself to them. We pray for... Um, those who are not with us today, those who can't make it through a sick, because of sickness or they're out of town or whatever other reason, God, and we pray that you would bless them abundantly with your grace, with your power, with your faithfulness, with your truth. Wherever they are, whatever they're doing, just touch their heart and mind wherever they are. Lord, as we get into your word this morning, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts that are ready to receive what your spirit is saying to us through the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, what we're doing is we're doing, we're getting back into Mark. Over the last few weeks, we've been on different subjects. We've been going over a little bit of evangelism, uh, becoming fishers of men. We've, actually, that was part of Mark. Um, but we've just been doing different topics. We've showed you guys how to do the Word of Life quiet time, but we want to come back to the book of Mark for a little while, too, and we're going to continue uh, starting in verse 21. So let's go ahead and read that. It says, and by the way, this is as Jesus has just finished calling his disciples to himself. He's on the seas of the shore of Gal... Uh, he's on the shore... On the seas. He's on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Thank you. And um, so he's calling them. He says, come, make, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. So the guys get up, they leave everything, they're following him. And where do they go? And they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Verse 25, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Um, as we get into this, when the supernatural God shows up, as we get into this, I think it's important today to start off with a little disclaimer. Um, as we see in the ministry of Jesus, he's often healing people. He's casting out demons. He's dealing with what we would sometimes today classify as mental illness. And sometimes it's not mental illness. It's really demon possession. And that's what we see in scripture. But before I even say that, I, I, first of all, I want to say there's three kinds of people. Three kinds of people. The first type of person is those who believe there's a demon behind every doorknob. And they believe that there's a spiritually evil force behind every single problem. There are those kinds of Christians. Maybe you're that kind of Christian here today. You think everything has a spiritual cause and spiritual root in a very direct way. And secondly, there are those of us who, because of our Western education, our material-focused mindset, our scientific age in which we live, we believe the spiritual realm never or almost never invades or intercepts with the natural realm. Both of those views are unbalanced and wrong. They belong in the margins somewhere. The real way is, is kind of operates like this. However, before I say anything else, I'd say probably maybe 90% of the Christians I meet fall into one of those two categories. But Jesus, 
and the Bible and reality is a little bit different. The truth is, is that whether it's physical or mental health problems, as we see in this passage, this guy could have been, I mean, if people had known he was uh, kind of loony or whatever he was, he actually had a demon, but he hid it well. But as we see throughout the Gospel of Mark and, and through the other Gospels, if people had really known uh, today, we probably would classify those people with mental health, health issues. Right? And I'm not saying there aren't genuine mental health issues. We'll get into that. But sometimes it's just a person has an actual chemical imbalance. They have a viral or bacterial infection that they need a doctor for, that they need medicine for. And sometimes it's actually spiritual. It's not one or the other. And we can't take a blanket approach to this. If you have a loved one who has a mental illness, I have a couple uh, loved ones with mental illnesses, you can't take a blanket approach to this. It has to be both and. Each of them has to be diagnosed for what it actually is, and then the appropriate measures should be taken. If it's, and here's the problem. Doctors generally aren't equipped and have no idea how to go get into someone's life. Or, or they, don't, they don't recognize a spiritual problem for what it really is. Right? So they don't know how to address that. And generally, we as Christians aren't, there's not many of us, I don't think, I'm looking around, is anyone here a doctor? There you go, my case in point. Jackson, I saw you raise your hand, but you're only 16 years old, so that's not going to work. <laughs> the, um, none of us are doctors, so we really don't have the eyes to see clearly that w- what uh, medicinal, uh, uh, how, how to address something medicinally. So the thing is, is we need both. Doctors and Christians really do need to work together. Um, I could tell you of stories where I've been in hospital wards um, where I had a loved one, a family member who was in the same hospital ward. It was a mental health uh, ward. And as I was walking down the hall, there was a guy, there's no question in my mind he was demonically possessed or oppressed. The things he was saying, the way he was acting, you could not act this way. And I've seen some pretty, uh, some other people with mental illnesses act like totally wigging out. What the doctors did, though, is they didn't discern him for what it really was. And what they did is, is they went in there, they subdued him, they gave him medication, threw him in his bed, and, and left him alone. That's not how it's supposed to work. And Jesus wouldn't have done it that way, and that's what we see here. At, at, at that same time, my family member, who loves Jesus tremendously, reads his Bible faithfully, shares the gospel faithfully, prays all the time, he was in there, and it wasn't a demonic issue, but he simply just needed his medication adjusted. So you have, and the problem with our societies is we're trying to take a blanket approach and everyone needs medication. Now I'm not saying, again, that some people don't need medication. In fact, some of you use it and need it and it's good for you, but we, don't, we over-medicate as a, as a society. I'm no expert in it, but it's just kind of obvious that not every single time is it possibly a mental illness or, or, or some type of disorder that we just need to medicate to death. Jesus has a way of healing people too. Okay, so with all that said, the common denominator is this. God loves people, and he wants to bring Christ-centered healing, whether it's through professional doctors or whether it's through prayer, miraculous healing, and the power of the gospel. Okay? Now, let's get into the text with all that said. I did want to preface it with that because when I, what we're going to be talking about today could look like that I'm just saying like every problem is a demon, and I don't want you to think that's what I think or that what's, what the, what's actually true. Okay, Mark one twenty one. Again, Jesus has just finished calling his disciples, and he says, And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. At this point in the Jew, Jews' history, all throughout the countryside and all the towns and villages, they set up synagogues. Synagogues were very similar to what we do as a church. They, they, they worshipped, they prayed, um, there was teaching. They were run by a group of elders. Then they would invite when, when a, te- a teacher was passing through the area, they'd invite him in. That was a customary thing to do at the time. So very similar to what we do as churches today. Of course, they didn't have, Christ had not yet died for their sins, and the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon the church. So it was a little bit different in that respect. Um, but in terms of the structures, not all that different. They met every Sabbath, which was Saturday. They met on, when, um, let me get this right, when, no, Saturday, Monday, and Thursday. They actually met three times a week. So they had three meetings a week where they got together, and there was one of these in each and every community, and it was run by a group of elders. Um, and the reason that Jesus, the reason I tell you this is because you'll often find that Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even the Apostle Paul later on would often visit synagogues. 
And the way, they, were, they were invited in because the customary thing to do was to invite the teacher who was traveling to come and, and speak to your group. Verse 22, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Scribes were some of the religious leaders of that day, and Jesus teaches a little differently. The scribes taught, and there was little or no spiritual power. You ever been to a church where there's little or no spiritual power? And you know it. It just reeks of death and complacency. Well, generally what the, the, the scribes would do is they would just quote other Jewish commentators, often conflicting with each other, but they didn't go directly to the word of God itself. Um, whereas when Jesus spoke, he, he was the word of God. He was the word of God in flesh. And when he spoke, he spoke in a compelling way, in a convicting way, with authority that changed lives, with a personally a spirit-filled life that he lived. Unfortunately, you know, the people were astonished when they heard Jesus. They were, they were astonished. But people are rarely astonished by what they hear or see at our church meetings. They don't see anything that makes them go, whoa, God is there. God is with you guys. And that's partially because God's word is not proclaimed as it should be. And it's not proclaimed in the way that it should be. And when I say in the way that it should be, all I simply mean is that when you, whether it's me or 10 years down the line, say like God gets you guys another pastor or we have other pastors on staff here, whoever is up here, whoever's preaching the word of God should live the life. If I'm not living a spirit-filled life, if you see inconsistencies in my life, feel free to tell me because I am accountable to God. And whoever's preaching the word is going to lose that spiritual authority if they lose that godly lifestyle. Okay, let's move along in the text a little bit here. Verse 23 says, And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. This unclean spirit was a demon. It simply means he was a demon. He had been residing quietly for God knows how long inside a man, and he couldn't take it anymore. He wigs out, he starts yelling, he cries out in anguish. Verse 24. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The Holy One of God. He knew who Jesus was, and you'll notice later on, Jesus doesn't listen to the demon and what he says about him. But more importantly here is that the demon actually says that what have you come to do with us? He identifies himself so closely with the man that there's almost no distinction whatsoever. The man is a demon-possessed man. And, and, and the demon is saying, what have you to do with us? He's not, what do you have to do with me? which is really interesting. And what it says to me, I'm not sure about this, but maybe what had happened was that the man had been some kind of a willing accomplice in some kind of unclean activity or ongoing sinful activity in which he was involved and he had opened up a door in his life for a stronghold, a demonic, satanic stronghold to develop that he could no longer get rid of. And little by little, the enemy had become, uh, the, 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 the unclean spirit had become so much a part of uh, this unclean activity in the man's life that there was almost no differentiation between what the man did and what the unclean spirit did. That's crazy to think that, God, that, that we could actually, as, a, as humanity, I'm not saying a Christian can be demon-possessed. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. It says, greater is he who is, in, who is in us than he who is in the world. But it is crazy to think that someone could be so controlled by Satan. You know when you hear those stories, oh, the devil made me do it? I always think, well, that's crazy. You did it yourself. You have, you're, you're responsible for yourself. Well, to a degree, there is a lot of influence, as we could see in this text. He identifies with the man that closely. Um, it's really interesting, too, because who knows how many times this man had actually gone to the synagogue. How many times had he heard the teaching of the Old Testament? How many times had he worshipped and prayed the prayers? Yet he sat there quietly, not saying anything, Hiding in his sin, hiding in unclean spirit, but when the Son of God shows up, when the presence of God shows up in the person of Jesus Christ, this man can no longer hide. The demon has to flee or freak out. 
Believe it or not, I'm convinced that there are people in Christian gatherings all over Maine and actually all over the world and maybe, maybe even here in our own church, people who can't stand God. They go to church, they do the religion, but they can't stand the true God of the Bible. And if he were to show up, they would have no idea what to do. Matthew Henry, who lived in a time and a place 250 years ago, which was much more spiritually healthy than what we have today, said this about the Christians in his churches. He said, there are many in our assemblies, and, and, and the spiritual climate there was a lot better than it is in our current society again. There are many in our assemblies who quietly attend under merely formal teachers. But if the Lord come with faithful ministers and holy doctrine, and by his convincing spirit, they are ready to say like this man, what have we to do with thee, Jesus of Nazareth? The same is true today. If Jesus were to show up, people would, wouldn't know what to do. It would mess them up. It would mess us up. Just imagine what it would be like today if we were to experience the true manifest presence of God. Now, I'm not saying that we can have more of God. Once we are saved, we have the Holy Spirit. Every single person has the exact same amount of the Holy Spirit. They have the person of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't come in ebbs and flows, but we're not always aware of it. And we're not always aware of him and his presence. But if we became aware, if God would open our eyes to become aware and conscious of who he is in his Holy Spirit, the manifest, that's called the manifest presence of God. If we were aware of that, it would mess us up. It would change things so much. We would weep in anguish over our sins. And we would weep in anguish over the sins of lost people because we love them. We would rejoice in hope because of what the Word of God says and the promises of the Word of God. In spite of the trials, in spite of the affliction, in spite of the sicknesses, in spite of the suffering, we would rejoice. We would melt with love and sometimes we would even, I, I, I guarantee, we would burst out with spontaneous praise because we love God so much. We would pray intensely. We would worship fervently. We would, those, well, let me, I think those, if there were demon-possessed people or demon-influenced or oppressed people, they, they would freak out. They would either leave us or they would convert to Jesus on the spot. If they got a real glimpse of who God is. You know, how many of you guys know the story of the prophets uh, of Baal on Mount Carmel in the Old Testament? These guys were committed pagans. They worshiped another God. But when God showed up, they fell down before the Lord and said, He, Jehovah, He is the God of Israel. He is the God of, they worshiped. Now, they didn't really repent and change, and eventually they actually ended up dying later, but we won't get into that, uh, that part of the story. <laughs> but the point is, is they came to a place where they said, no way, it's undeniable, he is God. We would be the same. God's manifest presence would mess you and me up in a good, bay, good way. If it happened today, if God revealed himself in, uh, today, he would mess us up. We'd want more of him. We wouldn't be eager to go home. We'd be on our faces before him. We'd be crying out to him. We'd be enjoying him. And we'd want more and more and more. And actually, every single great revival in history, every great revival in history has happened that way. Which is, when I say revival, I mean when the church has been revived, reinvigorated with the power of God, with the love of God, and sent out to serve in a, across the globe to make disciples of Jesus. Every revival has started that way. I think if that happened today, it'd mess us up. We'd miss our NFL games. Well, there would be a few dried out chickens this afternoon when we got home. They'd be a little be, our food would be a little overcooked. There might be a missed appointment or two. But you see, this is exactly what we need. We need the Holy Spirit to supernaturally manifest the presence of God in order to see and repeatedly experience a fresh spiritual revival in our church and other churches and to bring that on to the world who, need pe the world who needs Christ. May that be us. May we be that people. There aren't many of us. It doesn't take many of us. But may we be that church, you guys. That's my goal. That's Johnny's goal. That is the goal of Jesus, we believe. We're convinced of it, that he wants to make us that church. Verse 25. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. Here we go. Uh-oh. Jesus shows up and he exercises divine authority. Who can stand? Who can stand before the God, the Son, who created and sustains both the physical and the spiritual realms? And he issues his command with authority. The demon couldn't stand. 
and he had to flee. And the unclean spirit in verse 26, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. Excuse me. Even though this evil spirit and his master Satan hate God and reject Jesus, even though they hate him, the devil and all his demons are powerless to withstand the command of Jesus. The demon has been forced into submission. Now Jesus is gentle and he's mild and he's meek, right? Not always. Not always. Not, not with this man. Not all the time. And not with someone whom he says, I'm after you. I love you and I'm going to save you. Not when there's a demonic force opposing the will of God and the work of God and a man who was created in the image of God and for the glory of God. And Jesus says, demon, get out of my way. He's unclean now. I'm going to clean him up. And by the way, isn't that what he's done for all of us by dying on the cross for our sins? It may, maybe it wasn't as dramatic. Maybe there wasn't some demon exorcism or something. But hasn't he basically taken us from unclean to clean? Isn't that the simple gospel right there? We've, we've been forgiven of our sins. It's not that complicated. It's very simple. Uh, I digress and I lose my spot here. Here we go. How does this apply to us personally? Okay. It does apply personally. You may know of some sin in which you have done or some activity you've been involved in, which has opened a, a door for a demonic stronghold in your life that seems too strong and unbreakable. But that stronghold is blocking out the life of the Spirit from making you what you were meant to be and do what you were meant to do, and it needs to be overcome and broken. You say, what kind of things are those, Dave? How could that possibly? What, what are you talking about? Can you be more specific? Well, yeah, I will be more specific. Alcohol, drunkenness, drugs, are doorways into the demonic. Yes, it's the flesh and it's the sin, but it opens up a door. If you're a Christian, you won't be possessed by a devil, but you'll allow a stronghold so that it blocks out the light of Jesus. How else? Unchecked lust. Looking at and thinking about and doing things that you shouldn't do lustfully. Pride, thinking you're better than other people and not having a humble attitude. Hypocrisy, living a double life. Saying one thing to one person, another through another person, and living a life that doesn't match what you do on, on Sunday morning with the rest of the week or whatever it may be for you. Hypocrisy, anger, uncontrolled anger, outbursts of wrath is what the Bible says. Self-hatred, mutilation, hatred of others, manipulation, manipulating situations so that you control them and so that you're number one. The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will exalt you in due time. But God says that he opposes the proud. So this, this attitude, I'm going to control this, or I'm going to manipulate that, that doesn't work. And it opens up a door, potentially, for the demonic. Like I said, sexual sins. How about dwelling unrepentantly on sinful thoughts, lying, slander, gossip, dabbling with the, the occult or occultic activities, even like an eight ball. Even an eight ball, which is just a game, or a Ouija board. That kind of stuff, and many, many like it. Even some types of music, where the, uh, where the, um, uh, the musician has committed his soul and his music to Satan. In fact, some, when I was growing up, before I was a Christian, some of the best music that I liked, was, I found out later, was all com these guys committed their soul and sold their soul to Satan. I don't know how much of that's true and how much isn't, but there's a demonic stronghold potentially. These are the types of things that we need to be careful of and we need to turn from. Now you can pray for deliverance all you want, but what you need to do, and, and you can be as sincere as you want, and God may not deliver you. What you need to do is you need to take hold of the promises of God and engage in an all-out, no-holds-barred spiritual warfare, kind of like a soldier who's sieging a city with a bombardment of spiritual missiles until, until he knocks out the enemy and he knocks out the enemy's work. We stand here, or actually you guys sit there, I stand here, and we're here today saved by God's grace. We are children of God. We've become God's children. We're armed with his authority so we can successfully challenge every demonic force or satanic activity in the name of and by the authority of Jesus Christ. If you know of something robbing you of the, your joy and abundance that's yours in Christ, if you could think of something that you've done, some kind of sinful activity that's messing up your relationship with God and your usefulness of God, then stand up to the devil. Don't do it in your own strength because the Bible says we shouldn't do that. But we've been given authority in Jesus and in his strength, we should stand up to him and say, enough is enough. 
I will not allow this thing to control me or influence me anymore. I want Jesus. I want the presence of God in my life, and I want people to see him. Verse 27. All right, we're going over a little bit today. I hope nobody minds. Verse 27, and they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? So what's the effect when God shows up? That's what we're looking at here. What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. The people had never seen anything like this. Teaching with authority. And they could barely believe their eyes and ears. We may not. We, we probably wouldn't have either. The effect, the effect of what he did was a holy fire here in the text is set ablaze and the fame and the name of Jesus spreads everywhere. There's an attraction. Folks, it's no longer just business as usual at the first united synagogue of Capernaum. The Son of God has shown up. The Son of God has arrived. We need that today. We need Jesus to show up, not only today, but every day. There's a story of a woman who had been repeatedly invited to church. The pastor would invite her. No, no, no. He was declined who knows how many times. One night, there was a fire. The church went up in flames. It was set ablaze. Well, not only did the woman come out, but a whole crowd came out to watch the church on fire. When, When the pastor asked the woman why she was there, The answer was, well, when there's a fire, Pastor, everyone will come out to see. The problem is there was no fire in his church. And the problem is is that there's little or no fire in our teaching and in our living anymore. So little of God moving radically in churches and in personal lives that we've become accustomed to spiritual complacency. Listen, today in Maine, Your fellow Mainers, our fellow Mainers are out there. Over 90% of them are not in a church today. Only 2% of us in Maine claim to even believe the Bible as born-again evangelical Christians. That's not normal. We've become accustomed to a spiritual complacency that's not normal. In some countries, just 30% are are, are born-again evangelical believers. In fact, as a whole, the world, there's over 600 million of us And every year, 22 million people come to Christ, and hundreds of thousands of churches are planted. But we just think, oh, this is how it is in Maine. That's not how God wants it. That's not how God wants it. In fact, yeah, I won't won't go off onto that just for lack of time. But what we need is a fiery revival of Christ-centered preaching and Christ-like living sacrificially for one another and for the lost. We need it here in Maine, and only God can give it to us. We need it so that people can observe the reality of the, present, the presence of God, the manifest presence of God in our lives. When he looks at Carrie Sargent, when he looks at Sonny Spooner, when he looks at Justin, when he looks at me, he, people, not just he, but when people look at us, they should say, look at your family. Look at your job. Look at your life. Look at your parenting. Look at your marriage. There is God there. There is evidence of something much greater at work. And what that will do is that will spread the fame and the name of God. And that can only be helpful in sharing the gospel and in the spread of the gospel. It will validate. It's not the gospel itself, but it validates the gospel message. It beautifies it. It adorns it, is what the Bible actually tells us. So, as we close... I'd like to talk to two groups of people here. First group of you I'd like to talk to is those of you who are here and you have dabbled with or you have maybe you've dove headlong into some kind of evil habit or sinful activity, whether it's recently or something in your past and it's brought some kind of demonic stronghold into your life. We don't need to fear the devil anymore. You don't need to fear the devil. But if you know that God's manifest presence is not in your life, you need to do business today with God. You want to renounce it. You want to reject it. You want to repent of it in the name of and by the power of Jesus Christ. You want Jesus. You want his presence in your life. You want to see Jesus and his gospel validated in your life. If that's you, I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads with me right now. I'm going to ask that nobody be looking around, please. And if that's you, I'd like to pray for you specifically that you'd be able to reject, repent, and renounce anything evil that you've been involved in. 
If that's you, I'd like to pray for you. Would you be so kind as to slip up your hand so I could say a prayer for you? Thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm looking over to my right. Thank you. Is there anybody here? I'm looking directly in front of me. Okay, and over to my left. Thank you, guys. All right, let's pray, God. Guys, um, Father, we come before you, and I know that Jesus is all-powerful. When, uh, we want the Son of God. And there are things, I just pray for my brothers and sisters who raise their hand, that they are things in their heart right now that I pray that you would em- enable them, even as I pray, to be able to renounce that stuff, to be able to reject that stuff completely, to be able to repent of it, and not to do it in their own strength, but to stand firm in the grace of God in Jesus Christ and to do it. Lord, help them right now. Enable them. And I pray for your manifest presence in their lives. Whatever has blocked out the window and the light of Jesus coming to them, I pray that you would now replace that evil and those strongholds, that you would replace it with Jesus Christ in his presence. By the grace of God and by the authority of Jesus Christ, we reject the devil. We reject his work. We reject every demonic activity in and by the authority of Jesus Christ. Nothing coming from us, but all from you, Lord. We reject him in Jesus' name, amen. Secondly, there's a second group of you here today. You're here You've never been forgiven of your sins. You've heard the gospel before. You know that Jesus is real. You know that he's true. But you know that you're not right with him. And you want to get right with him. You want to be forgiven. If that's you, realize this. God does love you. He wants a relationship with you. He cares about you. He made you for himself. He made you to be with him. But you've rebelled against him. You've sinned against him. And the problem with that is this. The wages of sin is death. There's a punishment, a penalty for it. But God cares and he doesn't want to punish anybody. He doesn't want to punish you. He doesn't want to penalize you. He loves you. And so he sent Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice for your sins. And he he tells you that, that you need to repent and believe. You need to respond. As many as received him, the gospel of John says, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Did you know not everyone is a child of God? We're all God's creation, creatures. We are all loved by God, but not everyone's his child in the same sense. We become children of God through faith in Jesus and by receiving him. To as many as received him, to those who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God. What I want to do for you today is so that you will know your sins are forgiven, so that you will know that you are going to heaven for sure, and that you're starting, and, and so that you will ha- begin a new relationship with Jesus today, I'd like to pray for you. So once again, w- would you guys bow your heads with me? And I'm, I'm gonna pray a very simple prayer. And all you have to do is repeat it after me in your own heart. Now listen, this prayer doesn't save you. You've been told that before. But God sees your faith. Do you believe Jesus died for your sins and rose again? And if so, will you put your faith in him? Will you trust in him? Will you take the time to say, I'm turning from this lifestyle that's been so displeasing to you and I'm turning to you and I'm putting my trust in you alone. If you're ready to do that, let's pray together right now. Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for my sins. I know that I have done things that I I should not have done and not done things I should have done. I believe though that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again. I turn from those things, Lord, And I receive you as my Lord and Savior right now. I ask you to come into my life and to change my heart and save me from my sins and give me eternal life, please. I thank you that you do it because you promise if I ask anything according to your will, you would do it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer, would you be so kind as to just slip up your hand? Nobody looking around, please. I'm going to look over here to my right. I'm looking to my right here in the middle. And over to my left. Okay, let's pray. Father, uh, nobody's prayed to receive you as their Lord and Savior today. At least they didn't indicate that by a raised hand. But Lord, I, I know that your spirit's at work, and I thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of preaching a gospel that transforms lives. Bless us as we go from here. 
and whatever, what we do next, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, what I'd like to do now is have Susan come up and close us out with a final song. Now, the song that she's doing, some of the things that I've talked about a little bit today and that we've learned, seen in the Bible, just take some time. You can either read the lyrics, but take some time quietly. Don't, don't um, distract each other or anything, but just take some time to um, think about some of the things you've heard today or, or the lyrics. Dave asked me to uh, come up with a closing song, and we had had our Thursday rehearsal, and it kind of slipped my mind, and I said, well, think of something that would be really meaningful, and, uh, and Annie was part of the praise group that we had last year in high school, and this was one of the songs we did sing, because Derek had played the guitar, and we had a whole bunch of, and Brianna Springer, and the words that Annie sing are so powerful. It leads me to the cross, you know, where you hung and the redemption of in your blood was spilt so that I could be free. And sometimes we take that for granted. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for a long time. But as David said, uh, Pastor Dave said, you can get so complacent. And that's what we're facing in this world today. It's, it's so, this is the age of the what we call the Laodicea church, which is uh, it's lukewarm. And, and God said in Revelation, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you. You make me sick. And so don't ever take your redemption for granted because if it wasn't for Christ on the cross, it could have been you. So listen to Annie as she sings these words. Father, you have led us to the cross, and I thank you for Annie's talent to lead all of us. And Father, I thank you for all that you've done for us. I thank you for everyone sitting in this group today and those that have listened on the Internet. And Father, may it stir us to 
lead us all to the cross day after day. And it doesn't mean we have to go around, you know, bemoaning the faith that we're, you know, that we're just, oh, yeah, and all of this. But to take seriously that we can make a difference in our small corner, whether it's with our spouses, our children, our job, and to be a difference in everyone's life so that people can say, I know that that person, she's got Christ, or he's got Christ in her because I, they live it. They don't just preach it. They don't just talk it and say the glib words. They live it, and they believe it. And, Father, someday you will come back to make sure that all of us are accountable. So thank you for this evening, afternoon, or whatever. And, Father, I thank you that you have led us all to the cross. In your most holy, precious name, amen. My mic. Um, well, guys, I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to church, and thank you for being the church. A couple last, a couple few things um, few last things. Actually, one major last thing. Don't forget to sign up for snacks this week. Everyone look back at that table. How'd you enjoy your snacks? They were delicious, right? They don't exist today. And that is because, what's that? Yeah, no, I am hungry. I was born hungry, as my friend used to say. No, back here, don't forget, sign up for snacks on the board. And everyone, have a great time. Have a great week. Have a great rest of your Sunday. And if you talk to each other, have a good time getting to know somebody you don't know. All right? Thanks. Have a great week. Bye.